Welcome to the World Financial Symposium's Market Spotlight webcast series. Today's conference will start in a moment. The WFS is dedicated to educating technology leaders through webcasts like these and the Growth and Exit Strategies conference series held in London, New York, Silicon Valley, and other tech and financial centers around the world. The speakers and sponsors of these live events read like a who's who of industry leaders. To learn more about our live events for CEOs, owners, and investors, or to access our library of on-demand spotlight webcasts covering markets like IT security, health tech, gaming, and more, please visit WFS.com. And now, let's join today's Market Spotlight webcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Market Spotlights by World Financial Symposiums. My name is Rob Griggs, and I'm your host for today. Thank you for joining us for our Market Spotlight on payments. We'll start with an overview of the payments landscape. Then the Quorum Research Team will review the tech M&A trends in the payments market, followed by our Market Spotlight interview with special guest Darren Klum of Secured2. And lastly, we'll give you 10 tips on how to get a maximal valuation for CEOs considering a tech M&A exit. Let's get this started. As a senior deal maker here at Quorum Group, I am no stranger to this space. I have over 25 years experience in payments processing. I raised $50 million in venture capital money with Insight and then sold my company as the largest third-party payment processor in the late 1990s to a public company. I've written numerous blogs on this topic and helped co-author Quorum's top 10 disruptive tech trends around payments and digital currency flow for many years now. I've also personally guided two payments processing companies to very successful M&A exits. Quorum has done a number of deals in or related to this space. In the tombstones you see here, Quorum was the sell side advisor for each of the selling companies. Last year, the United States increased mobile payments by over 35% to $175 billion in transactional volume. In fact, the Starbucks mobile app did more volume in mobile payments than Apple Pay did with all their vendors and merchants. The Chinese increased their mobile payments last year by 35% too. They did $17.5 trillion, over 100 times larger than the United States market in doing mobile payments. The Chinese really are quite a bit ahead of us, and there's a very large market opportunity for us in the United States to increase our mobile payments volume. With offline and online commerce effectively merged, and every transaction a digital transaction, acquirers see significant value in controlling the digital streams of payments. Last year, that drove over $85 billion in disclosed deal value for payment processors and hundreds of deals across a variety of sectors. Private equity in particular is showing increased interest in tech solutions that serve as payment pathways to vendors, utilities, service providers, and others, even if a relatively small component of the overall feature set. This can create increased value in unexpected sectors such as nonprofits, property management, and even narrower niches. One of our clients here at Quorum, Blue Cow Software, leveraged his suite of software solutions designed for the fuel, oil, propane, and HVAC industries into an acquisition largely driven by this trend. In addition to payments in all its various forms, billing, invoicing, procurement, transaction processing, and more, supplementary technologies can also be bolstered by this trend, like payment management, anti-fraud capabilities, and real-time payment technology. Anything that gets an acquirer closer to achieving payment stream control has a built-in advantage in tech M&A. Now let's head over to Matt Haberlock from the Quorum Research Team to dive into the nuts and bolts of the tech M&A activity in this space. Matt, take it away. Public payment companies are trading at record high multiples, ending the year at over 5.5 times revenue and just over 25 times EBITDA. And while EBITDA metrics appear to have fallen significantly since September, when we look at the larger five-year trend, we can see that both EBITDA and revenue multiples are up nearly 100% since the beginning of 2015. Looking at M&A activity in the payment space since 2015, one might be surprised that deal volume and total deal value are moving in opposite directions. Despite deal volume hitting a five-year low, it was a huge year for payment deals, with total deal value setting a new high of $88 billion and smashing through the previous record of $33.4 billion set in 2017. So what's going on? Perhaps the most obvious explanations for the strikingly high level of deal values in payments M&A are the mega deals that have occurred this year. Three deals worth over $20 billion each were announced. In the largest payments deal ever, Fidelity acquired WorldPay for a massive $32 billion at 11 times revenue. In January, Pfizer announced that it was acquiring First Data for $22 billion, but at only four times revenue, a much more palpable premium compared to Fidelity's acquisition. And 
the third deal over $20 billion. Global Payments acquired Total System Services for $21.5 billion. Who has been snatching up the most payment companies this year? There haven't been any standout buyers purchasing an unusual number of companies, but PayPal and EVO Payments were the most active, with the modest six acquisitions each since 2018. ACI Worldwide, MasterCard and Visa, PayU out of the Netherlands, and Elevon, a U.S. Bank Corp. subsidiary, round out the other most active buyers in the payment space since 2018, each having bought three or more companies. Now, let's look at a few other interesting deals that took place in the payment space. Before its $4 billion acquisition of Honey in November 2019, PayPal coughed up over $2 billion for iZettel, provider of mobile point-of-sale systems for businesses as it looks to strengthen its presence in brick-and-mortar retail. In a public-to-private leverage buyout, Black Hawk Network was acquired by private equity firm Silver Lake and P2 Capital Partners for $3.5 billion, representing a 24% premium above Black Hawk's share price. Level Up, whose platform engages customers with digital ordering, payment, and loyalty experiences, was swallowed by Grubhub for $390 million cash. Level Up should help Grubhub expand from being an aggregator of demand to also helping manage core business operations for their restaurant customers. In South Africa, payment processor PayFast was bought by DPO Group, a Kenya-based payment services provider seeking to expand its geographic footprint. In real estate, NASDAQ-listed RealPage picked up ClickPay, for $219 million, at a hefty 11 times revenue. The pickup expands RealPage's footprint in both the HOA owner-occupied segment of real estate, as well as the New York metro market. In June, Visa pocketed Rambus for $75 million in a bid to strengthen its tokenization capabilities. And lastly, in a small cross-border transaction, India-based payments firm Transcorp International was acquired by U.S. public firm Ebict for $7.4 million. Transcorp was one of the top five largest international remittance players in India. With this deal, EBICS further strengthens their position in the Indian financial exchange market. To summarize, the payments industry continued to consolidate in 2019, with deal volume at a low, but deal value remaining near all-time highs. According to 451 Research, median deal value of payments acquisitions rose from 2.8 trillion revenue in 2018 to nearly 6 revenue in 2019. While historically viewed as a detriment to profit, payments are beginning to be seen as a way to drive top-line growth, evidenced through the PayPal Honey and Grubhub Level Up deals. And lastly, scale, fraud prevention, mobile wallet, and customer experience engagement solutions are receiving serious attention in the payments M&A space. Great job, Matt. Thanks for your report. Now, let's turn to our Market Spotlight interview to get some perspective from those in the know on what's happening in the payments space. We have as our special guest today, Darren Klum, CEO and founder of Secure2. Darren, great to have you on. To start things off, can you tell us a bit about what your company does? Secure2 is a Minneapolis-based data security company that's developed the world's first post-quantum data security solution that provides total quantum resiliency for all of your data. We have deployed our industry-leading security into our partners, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, where we embed our security into their applications like Outlook and Gmail, just to mention a few, or we host applications that we built around our security in the areas of data management and team collaboration. We're also the first security solution in the market with a strong enough security to offer uh, our customers indemnification and a warranty that is backed by Lloyd's of London with over a million dollars per user of coverage. Uh, We currently have over 32 patents, and we continue to lead the zero-trust marketplace of security solutions for any vertical market like financial, legal, medical, government, and military customers. Very interesting. What are people demanding today in the digital payments space? What are the new expectations? The market is fractured today, and what we're seeing is it's really broken into two segments. And the segments are are grouped together, and I would classify them as the ultimate digital adopters. That's the Gen Z, the Millennials. And then you would have the skeptical adopters, which is the Gen X and the baby boomers. And so as we look at the millennials and the Gen Z markets, um, we know their lives are really centered on mobile devices. You know, show me a young kid today that does not have a mobile phone. They're all mobile. They want immediacy. They want what they want, and they want it right now. And especially when it comes to payments, uh, they don't want to have any friction get in the way of them getting what they want. So um, that immediacy is, is very critical to these younger generations. As well, these younger generations require personalized content. Uh, They want everything to be engaging and entertaining and and gamified. 
Um, and then the other thing we see is that these millennials and Gen Zs are really the first two digital lifestyle groups that are going to really demand automation. They want people to do the work for them, and there's nothing better than automation because it makes them do one thing less and makes their life easier. So we, we see the Gen Z and millennials really embracing a lot of these new technologies where, again, the Gen X baby boomers are very risk averse. Apps like Venmo, um, they're very, very popular. And, you know, those younger generations, the Gen Zs and millennials have just been using it like crazy. Uh, but we're still seeing um, some risk aversion uh, with some of the older groups that just are, aren't quite sure and are kind of being dragged into those platforms by their kids. Uh, so that's kind of what we're seeing today. But, but things are changing rapidly. And I do believe that as security uh, becomes stronger and uh, the older generations become more comfortable with the risk, um, adoption of some of these digital uh, payment systems is going to grow. One of the big trends that we're following right now is collaboration and cooperation. It's really this whole idea of collaboration and cooperation that's behind some of these exciting and emerging technologies like blockchain, uh, distributed transactions, and social spending. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of companies in the financial services industry uh, embracing uh, more collaborative uh, capabilities, and they're going to be looking for partners that can give them those better tools and methods of collaboration. Uh, so to meet the huge demand of collaboration that I see coming, um, partnerships will form, and these partnerships will drive changes in the industry. Uh, the other trend that we're following is automation. We mentioned that before, um, but we're, we're learning that, that people don't want to do the work anymore. They don't want to balance a checkbook. They don't want to um, have to do anything manually. They, they want the technology to automate and do those tasks for them. So we, we believe that uh, as we move into the future, we see huge opportunities in the area of automation, in the, in the digital payment space, and in, especially in digital banking. What's your view on the M&A activity in the digital payments space? Who's buying, who's selling, and why? What we're seeing now is a commoditization of payment service providers across the board. Uh, most of the digital payment systems are really nothing more than MeToo services and have very little to differentiate from one another. And now with the rise of the clouds, what we're seeing is that problem of, of scaling platforms and applications is going away. And this is really allowing a flood of new payment systems to enter the market. Uh, applications like uh, Stripe that's, that's really commoditizing transactions, Venmo, et cetera. Um, but still, there's a lot of room for improvement. And I do believe uh, with uh, the advent of the cloud and its expansion, uh, new solutions are really emerging every day. Also, the digital payment markets is uh, very fragmented at the current time. And it's a market that's in constant flux with a lot of new things happening and, and transactions happening constantly. So you're seeing larger companies getting gobbled up by much bigger international banking or cloud companies. And the research is actually showing that 19% of transactions in this space were financial buyers. Um, and the largest amount uh, were really strategic uh, acquisitions uh, that would uh, basically make up 81% of the transactions. Um, also interesting is most of the acquisitions in the market were related to three key factors. Uh, one would be uh, talent acquisition, uh, two, market expansion, and then number three is finding a technology advantage that can differentiate your company. So those are kind of the, the three main drivers that we see right now. Uh, in terms of who's buying, uh, we see that PayPal recently acquired iZettle in, in 2018. Uh, Fiserv acquired First Data, which was a, a really big transaction. Uh, we saw FIS uh, acquire WorldPay and Vantive. And we're also seeing big conglomerates that are buying well-established companies so they can expand markets and add service capabilities. Uh, so, um, you know, a company like MoneyGram, for instance, um, under the weight of its own debt, uh, had to sell to Ant Financial, which was a, a really big deal. And I think what we've learned out of that transaction and then the other ones that we're seeing is it's really not necessarily about a big fish eating a little fish. It's really more about um, that acquisition of uh, complementing solutions, uh, or in the case of some of the bigger transactions, really about market expansion. Interesting. Let's talk about the future. 
Uh, the digital payment space will really be on a race for zero for revenue as the market expects to pay nothing for any of these things. So uh, fees will lessen, uh, but the scale and the global reach will continue to grow. So um, I believe uh, certain carriers will um, kind of grow out and become the leaders just based on their ability to hit scale faster than, than other solutions. Um, but at some point, there'll be a tipping point when all the digital payment solutions will be collapsed and consumed by the large cloud providers. Um, you're already starting to kind of see this. So I see the ultimate winner in digital payments in the future really being the large cloud companies um, who are flush with cash, can survive long enough to capitalize the in entire electronic payment system. They can entirely wait out markets and they can actually give away stuff for free because they have other uh, revenue channels that can offset it. So um, we're already kind of starting to see this, this happen, uh, but I think the ultimate winners in the long run are gonna be the large cloud providers. What advice do you have for CEOs listening who are considering selling their payments related technology company? Uh, relationships are what sell companies. And uh, you may think it's your technology or you may think it was your revenue last quarter, but when you look at acquiring a company, it's about fit, it's about people, it's about relationship. So the deeper and the more integrated you can get with your partner uh, before acquisition, uh, the better uh, your exit event will be. Because at the end of the day, every acquisition, no matter what, is gonna come down to a financial decision and it's gonna come down to a number and you have to be able to tell a customer and revenue story that adds value to their current customer and revenue story. Excellent, thanks Darren for joining us and sharing your insights. There is a very unique window open right now. As we've been saying at Quorum, we are 10 years into a seven year bull run cycle. Even if you aren't considering an exit, it is worth it to engage in initial M&A process if for no other reason than to calibrate your company's value. It's important to know that tech M&A is incredibly complex and requires a solid process and a team to do it well. To highlight some of that process, I'd like to turn it over to Winston to close us out with 10 tips on how to get maximal valuation for your tech company. Winston? Number one, software companies and traditional firms do not match up. Their fixed and variable costs are different. A typical software firm is potentially much more profitable and valuable. On average, they sell for over eight times the same size traditional company. Never engage with someone who is not tech-specific to represent you. They have neither the credibility on preparing valuations, nor the access to buyers and process to get you anywhere near the price you deserve. Number two, strategic buyer valuations must look carefully at the underlying value components, which are often intangible, reflecting future potential. Intellectual property, user bases, channel partners, recurring revenue, SEO, domain expertise, and R&D. These can be more valuable than your current revenue, especially to that buyer that has the trade name, global distribution, and the related installed base you need to really grow. Number three, in selling a tech company, it's about the story. Dry financials are insufficient. Paint a picture of your company, the position, value proposition, the unique opportunity it represents its trajectory, even the opportunities to break into different markets. Remember, with technology, the buyers are buying the future, not just past financials. So, the very first paragraph of your executive summary should be able to properly portray the value you represent. Number four. Most traditional companies rely on book value, liquidation value, and the balance sheet as a primary valuation method, not software companies. Sales and earnings multiples of public company comparables, similar M&A transactions, and discounted cash flow are most often used. Unique to technology is replacement cost analysis, dollars per R&D developer, and time to market analysis. Generally, there is a very wide range of valuations, so they are weighted to get an average. Number five, give serious attention to your proformers. Your final value may hinge on them, your financials need to include statements from the past three years, recast per gap standards, plus three years of projections with detailed assumptions supporting your strategy, growth, and profits. If these are not included, the foundation of your entire valuation can be undermined. Number six, public peer data serves as an objective measure of value. The analysis involves a comparison to primary operating metrics, such as recurring revenue and service, enterprise value to sales, and enterprise value to a bidder for companies much like yours. 
In some cases, your technology or revenue model can position the company into multiple peer groups with radically different valuation metrics. This is where deeper analysis is needed. Number seven, comparable transactions is one of the most popular valuation methodologies as it shows what similar companies sold for. Since earnings of privately held companies are seldom published, the sales multiple is the most common metric used. In other words, if a company just like yours sold for five times sales, it's reasonable to assume that you will sell for five times sales. The big caution here is that data on private companies is hard to find and has to be current, as trends that drive value are constantly changing. This is where an advisor with a strong research team is critical. Number eight. Discounted cash flow, DCF, attempts to capture the present value of your cash flow going into the future. This is critical from a buyer's perspective as it can impact public share value. Tech and non-tech buyers alike rely on this methodology. PE investors will pour through your assumptions. This method is especially useful to young tech companies that have an insufficient track record to use the other revenue or earnings valuation models. Number nine, replacement cost may be useful for a seller where other valuation methods don't fairly capture your value. Examples would be at the extremes raw startups and legacy companies. Startups may represent a time-to-market solution for a critical technology. What's that worth in today's white-hot competitor environment where time-to-market can mean leadership or even survival? Legacy companies may have generations of technology represented, often deep domain expertise and established user bases that current financial multiples just don't properly capture. Thus, a replacement cost analysis may be justified. Number 10. Weighted averages provide a good way to balance the major approaches. Public company multiples, comparable transactions, and discounted cash flow. You can move the weightings to support your strategy or dynamics of your market. Again, supporting research is critical to establish the weightings. While the mechanics of these methodologies can help frame your value, getting the high end of valuations requires a global search to create an auction process. There are more buyers than people realize many with excess cash looking to invest. Unfortunately, too many founders wait for buyers to call them, which usually involves some bottom feeders who want to lock you up in exclusive negotiations. You will never get an optimal deal if you wait for them to call. Experience shows that when properly executed, an auction process will generate 48% greater transaction value for the owners with better terms on structure, liabilities, and employment agreements. We hope you enjoy today's online symposium. If you have any questions not answered, please submit them to info at wfs.com. We look forward to seeing you at one of our upcoming live events in a city near you. To register for these live events, view upcoming webcast topics, or hear rebroadcast of this or other market spotlight events, please go to wfs.com. Thank you for attending today's webcast.